my colleague, Reverend Tandy Rogers, tells a story about working with a group of young people who are planning a conference. During one intense session, an agenda item got everybody's feelings all stirred up. And one teen asked a question that easily could have been read as attacking the youth who proposed the topic. So Tandy, as the adult, was defensive on her behalf and was just getting ready to jump in when the youth stuck three fingers out from the side of her face. And she looked at the young person who was facilitating the meeting. The facilitator called on her and she proceeded to ask a series of questions directly to the other teen. They weren't terse or tense, she writes, they were clarifying. So these two teenagers who had seemingly been at odds were having a civil back and forth that led to a middle ground compromise and the planning continued without drama. To use Tandy's words, what magic was this? <laughs> Apparently, this gesture represented the whiskers of a curious cat who needed to ask clarifying questions. Our young people have all sorts of creative ways to bring us back into right relationship. As humans, our default defensiveness is just that. It's a default. It's a primitive part of our brains designed to defend us from the unknown, to keep us from questioning the common wisdom of our tribe, which had been passed down by elders who had survived predators and the elements. Because to go it alone, was a literal death sentence to our ancestors. It's our nervous systems preparing our bodies to fight or flee or stand perfectly still and blend into the scenery. So how was it then that these young leaders were able to circumvent millennia of nervous system evolution simply by placing a hand gesture against their cheek? I believe the answer is twofold. One, practice. And two, you know what I'm going to say, covenant. <laughs> That's right. We all experienced mere moments ago a conversation in which we established that multiple things could be true at the same time, that there is more than one way to be right. However, what is the best food is arguably a low stakes topic. Unfortunately, the higher the stakes, the less access we have to our logic centers. The subject may not literally be life and death, chances are it's not, but our primitive brain will take over if we perceive that difference as a threat because we're hardwired for survival. So, if we want to be open-minded, if we value pluralism, as we say, if we want to strive for creativity in how we do things, we will have to diffuse that automatic response. So we can begin by making curiosity a practice. I wonder what that could look like. Here's one suggestion. Could you set a aside a time each evening to review your day? Asking yourself, where did I get annoyed that things didn't go my way? Or that someone said something that I didn't agree with? First question, was there an actual threat? If not, can you access that sense of wonder regarding the circumstances or mindset of the other people involved? 
Now, I wonder why they're such a jerk is probably not the best way to ask the question, but a genuine curiosity, one where we want to know a person more deeply, even when we're not on the best of terms with is what we're talking about here. Curiosity about their childhood, about their hopes, their dreams, their family life, their life experience, where their ideas come from. Can we seek to understand another person the way we long to be understood? So let's pause for a moment. I invite you once again to close your eyes and scan your body. What sensations do you notice in your body as a reaction to my suggestions? Does this practice feel like a threat? There are no right or wrong answers to these questions. Just notice. As you open your eyes once again, I encourage you to remember this is not just an intellectual exercise. This is a whole being practice. So you might want to breathe into any tension or pain that you experienced. And you may feel better if you shake out or stretch tense body parts. We may also discover that there are very real threats in our lives. Perhaps you're in an abusive relationship. Maybe your workplace is indeed hostile. The acts of oppression directed at your identity may be truly terrifying. I don't wanna minimize any of those realities. And a practice like this can help us separate the experiences where we default to defensiveness unnecessarily from those true dangers that need our attention and planning to keep us safe. Conversely, we might also become aware of our own biases and tendencies to automatic judgment and closed-mindedness, which make us the threat. I will refer you to last week's sermon for more on that. So we can also cultivate curiosity together. Can you identify some folks in your life with whom you can be completely vulnerable and honest? Are there people you know who can challenge your thinking in a way that doesn't feel threatening? Are you part of a group where brainstorming and asking questions in good faith is part of the culture? Or are you the leader of a team or the grown up in a family where you have the power and privilege to hold space for this type of exploration? Creating this balance of comfort and challenge in our relationships and communities has to be intentional. For as we've already discussed, defensiveness is our biological default. I doubt that you would be able to use the curious cat hand gesture at your office staff meeting, but it might work at your dinner table. And as Unitarian Universalists, we also have another tool at our disposal, and that is our practice of crafting covenants. A covenant is a sacred agreement of how we intend to be with one another. It's a declaration of embodied love and it is the organizing principle of our faith. Here, we teach even our youngest children to create a covenant in their faith formation classrooms. A covenant is created by the folks who choose to be in a particular relationship and it is a living agreement that can be revisited and revised as the group sees fit. A covenanting community can decide to respect the whiskers or choose any other practice for keeping the relationship reciprocal, caring, and kind. 
A covenant can and should state how we will challenge each other and be accountable to one another. To be curious does not mean that we don't try to persuade. It simply invites us to debate in good faith with mutual respect. Living into our covenants most definitely requires curiosity and wonder at the many different ideas and lived experiences the various group members bring into that relationship. So think again about those people or groups with whom you can truly relax and be yourself. Because our need for safety and our need for belonging go hand in hand. In a space where we belong, a space of trust and security, then we can have access to our creativity. We can explore new ideas and innovative solutions, knowing that any outcome, even an unexpected or undesired one, is an opportunity for growth or learning rather than punishment or mockery. Here we can expand our capacity for tolerance, acceptance, and understanding. Curiosity allows us to be transformed through our relationships. We can let loose and allow our body mind to be flooded with joy and compassion, ideal states for healing and renewal and genuine rest. Spiritual heart-to-heart -heart connection is possible, which is sacred and holy. But it only works when we short-circuit judgment and defensiveness by practicing curiosity and love. I wonder what we can do from that place of safety and wholeness. A curious mind and body are free to experiment with radical ideas for social change and mutual aid, to try on new forms of organization and cooperation, and to expand the circle of love and care to include the earth and our plant and animal kin. In other words, curiosity can help us change the world and allow those streams of love that we were singing about to flow. Are you in? Yeah. yeah. May it be may it be so.